It's 12 noon in Los Angeles, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. And there's that fake applause. <laughs> really fake applause. Hello, you guys. How are you? Good to see you. Hopefully, I am broadcasting. The system was feeling a little less than cooperative tonight. Let's see. Says I've got an excellent connection, and there I am. Yay! All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the big show. I'm still not back in Los Angeles, but hopefully heading home on Wednesday. Um, yep, it's taxi time. And tonight we're going to do a music biz quiz. I really miss my roadcaster. <laughs> wall to wall, Michael. Really? Okay. Um, hello, you guys, Ken Messer, Dan Weber, Marion Laird, Jim Stamper, Alex Dillon, Chris Anderson, Buffalo Bob, Dean Turner, Peter Rahill, Keith Sumner, Andre Stepanian, John Hope, uh, Jesse J. Peck, RKR, um, okay. So anyway, um, I've been writing a little music biz quiz, and uh, I think, hello, Simon, how are you? Um, I'd like to award some sort of prize tonight. Um, and I'm trying to think of how we can score this. Um, Dave Friedland is mellow. I like it. Um, so how can we score this thing? All right, so Liz, if you can grab a piece of paper and pen and do chicken scratches, maybe. Um, so what we're going to do, I think I've got like 20 or 21 or 22 questions. The show may not last an hour tonight, quite frankly. Um, it's my second of the last night here and a chance to spend a little time doing family movie night with my family. So if we don't go 90 minutes tonight, please forgive me. Um, so I'm going to ask you the questions. Some of them require a straight up answer. Some of them are multiple choice. Some of them are true false. We know from past experience that uh, the first right answer is going to get a chicken scratch, okay? And the person who's got the most chicken scratches at the end of tonight's episode, uh, what should I give away? Should I give away a free membership or renewal? Um, a free foot massage? <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. Um, Try to think what other I know a free taxi hoodie. So what do you say? Everybody who thinks I should do a membership or renewal, um, give me a plus one. And everybody who thinks that we should give away one of our gorgeous taxi hoodie sweatshirts, give me a plus two. And we'll take a quick count and see what we should give away as the prize tonight. I guess the people who are giving the plus two for the hoodies probably just recently renewed or something. <laughs> That's pretty fun. <laughs> All right. Well, it looks like the free membership or renewal is going to take the prize to, or be the prize tonight. Um, sorry, it's 10 o'clock at night. Uh, once again, I got up at like, oh, actually, I slept in this morning. I got up at 7. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, hello, Nancy Kalel. How are you? 16 renewals, 5 hoodies. Okay. Well, that's it. Uh, so, yeah, if you're not a member yet, uh, you'll get a free membership year. And if you are already a member, you will get a... Uh, uh, free renewal. Okay, so here's the deal. Once again, um, this is going to be a little sloppy. I know from doing quizzes in the past, um, we know that sometimes when people type in an answer, somebody else's answer pops up and they're like, no, I got the first one in. Whatever shows up on Liz's chat is the winner. That's, that's the only way we can play this. Um, we don't know why that is, but sometimes things show up on people's chat that is not what Liz sees or what I see. So um, Liz is going to be the arbiter of who wins each point. 
And with that, let's begin on tonight's um, Taxi Music Biz Quiz. Oh, before I start, I want to tell you guys that are regular quarantine happy hour goers that the animals in the backyard, uh, I've got a camera in the backyard and I've been watching it uh, the whole time I've been over here, which has been like five and a half weeks now. Um, the animals are going crazy. Uh, the loquat tree has given up its fruit, and so therefore we've got raccoons, bunny rabbits, and squirrels all day long setting off the uh, little alarm on my phone. Okay, um, <laughs> like that's really important, right? <laughs> all right, here we go. Taxi's Music Biz Quiz for May 24th of 2021. And the first question is, when you license both sides of a piece of music, what are those two sides? I'll repeat that. When you license both sides of a piece of music, what are those two sides? Dun, dun. Ooh, I can't do that. The Google will uh, disallow my video or whatever they call it. I'm waiting for those answers to roll in. Come on. Nope, Alex Dillon. <laughs> nope, nobody's gotten it yet. The two sides, when you license both sides of a piece of music, what are those two sides? All right, I'm going to give it to... I think Chris Anderson was the first person to get this, which is... The two sides, now, you know what, that's not close enough. Um, oh, you guys are so close. Nobody has said the exact words that are usually referred to when talking about this. This is, I thought this was an easy one. I, do, I have some multiple choice coming up <laughs> for the kids who are a little slow. Uh, I'll give you a hint. One of the words, <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing this. One of the words starts with the letter C. Oh, John Solly got it. Master in Composition, yay! Master in Composition, those are the two sides that they're referring to. Good job, John Solly. Congratulations. I've never seen you in the chat room before, so welcome to the show. Good first, uh, first whatever you call it. You're hot right out of the gate. <laughs> uh, hello, Heidi. John Solly goes, yeah, I got it. Excellent job, excellent, excellent, excellent. Ooh, this one's a tough one. Let's see who gets this one. All right, question number two for this week's Taxi Music Biz Quiz. When you're paid an upfront fee when, you're, when you license your music for a TV commercial, what do they often call that fee in the world of advertising? When you're paid an upfront fee when you license your music for a TV commercial, what do they often call that fee in the world of advertising? Nope. Sorry, Dan. Sorry, Ken. Nope. A retainer. I <laughs> know. Unfortunately, that's only lawyers. <laughs> That's the scariest word in the English language to me. Nope, nope, nope. Slush money. <laughs> Jim Snapper. What is slush money? Dave Freeland. Free money. Upfront fee. Nope. Who has it? No. Nope, Jan doesn't have it. 
a bribe. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> that might be a better answer than everybody else is coming up with so far, Nancy. A buyout? No. Not a licensing fee. Commercial license? No. Come on, you guys, you can do better than this. I stayed up late to do this and spent a good chunk of my Sunday coming up with these really incredible questions. Nope, not a royalty, not writer share, not a blanket, not a payout. I'll read the question one more time. Uh, when you're paid an upfront fee, when you, yeah, would I put the answer in the question? No, I know you guys are smarter than that. When you're paid an upfront fee, when you license your music for a TV commercial, what do they often call that fee in the world of advertising? A lovely day. We forget the question. I'm going to say it one more time and then I'm giving you the answer if nobody gets it. Uh, when you're paid an upfront fee, when you license your music for a TV commercial, what do they often call that fee in the world of advertising? A down payment. <laughs> Oh man, you guys crack me up. A deposit, an upfront charge. Yo, Stan, good to see you. Wrong answer, buddy. All right, I'm going to tell you. All right, nobody gets a point on that one. It's called a creative fee because advertising people are so creative. That's what they call it. I've even said that on the show. I've tried to make every question on here something we've talked about. And you could make an argument. Yeah, it's a sink fee, but no, in the, in the word, notice I added the words at the end of the question. Um, what do they often call that fee in the world of advertising? A creative fee. Yep. All right. Marion, I don't think you've missed anything on Taxi TV. You've probably got one of the highest attendance records of all time. Um, okay. And the next question, oh, this one's a doozy. All right, this is question number three, I believe, in this week's Taxi Music Biz Quiz. Man, I missed the roadcaster. All right, listen carefully. When you're offered $100,000 to license one of your songs for a TV commercial and you realize the vocalist died 10 years ago and you never got assigned work for hire from him or her, you, A, say, what the hell, they're dead. They can't come after me for any money and license the music anyway. B, make every possible effort to track down the singer's heirs to get permission to use the vocal. C, forge a work for hire and d tell the ad agency the singer is dead and you've made every attempt to contact the heirs both publicly and privately and ask if they'd still like to move forward I believe Alex Dillon, where did it go? Alex Dillon got it. Um, yes, uh, B, it was kind of a trick question, a trick answer. Yes, you should make every possible effort, you know, as in letter B, to track down the singer's heirs and get permission. But ultimately, if you can't, you tell the ad agency the singer's dead. I've made every effort, uh, and you'd probably want to provide some paperwork to contact the heirs both publicly and privately, and ask if they'd still like to move forward. Because if you go for letter B and just make every possible effort, then what? So you've made the effort. 
you still got to either sweep it under the rug and not tell the ad agency, which would be very, very, well, it'd be morally wrong, I believe, ethically wrong. Um, very, very dangerous to your career because let's say that you do that. Let's say you make every possible effort and it fails and you just sweep it under the rug and don't mention it to the, to the ad agency. And then the singer, lo and behold, um, had a, a spouse or a child or somebody and they go, I know that's my dad's voice on that thing. And they come out of the woodwork. So you really need to let the ad agency and, and I, if I had to guess, this is just an educated guess, I'd say about 50% of the time they'll go, okay, you've proved to us that you made best possible efforts on this. We believe that there's no way to contact any of the heirs uh, of the, the deceased vocalist, so we're going to go ahead and use it. Somebody once told me, I don't know if this is 100% true or not, that they knew of a case where the agency actually put aside a piece of the money um, in some sort of escrow that should the uh, deceased person materialize or an heir materialize, that they had money in escrow so that everything looks super kosher. I can't verify that. I've only been told that once, so, you know. Word of mouth. Personally, I like letter C. <laughs> Forge a work for hire. <laughs> okay. Um, Call Aaron Jacobson. There you go. All right. Broadcast quality. This is number four, I believe. Um, and the question is, broadcast quality means that your music was recorded in a professional studio. True or false? Broadcast quality means that your music was recorded in a professional studio. True or false? I know you guys can get this one. Chris Hall, look at that. Chris Hall, uh, you came up first on mine, assuming you did on Liz's as well. You are the big winner on this one. Ooh, I haven't, what happens if we have a tie? I know, if we have a tie, I'm gonna flip a coin. One of you will get the hoodie and one of you will get the free renewal or free membership. How's that? Uh, all right. We are cruising right along. Okay, this is question number five, and it goes like this. What is the typical range of sync fees paid when songs are licensed for TV shows? A, $20,000 to $50,000. B, $200 to $500. C, $2,000 to $5,000. And D, as little as they can get away with paying you. Once again, what is the typical range of sync fees paid when songs are licensed for TV shows? A, twenty to fifty thousand dollars. B, two hundred to five hundred dollars. C, two thousand to five thousand. And D, as little as they can get away with paying you. It's amazing how many people fell for the trick answer. All right, I'm going to have to go with assuming Lou's got the same thing. Looks like Ken Mesford got it with answer C, which is $2,000 to $5,000. And that's pretty typical. Um, if I wanted to narrow it down a little tighter, I would say probably $2,500 to $3,500. But $2,000 to $5,000 is a safe range, and that's where things typically go. Uh, let's see, Libby Harrison... I'm going back, Libby, like I said, what, what shows up in your chat feed is not what shows up in our feed. So that's why I made a, a point uh, of saying earlier, yeah, in my feed, Chris Hall was about eight answers above you. Sorry, Libby. Those is the rules of the game. Uh, Oh, and for those of you who answered as little as they can get away with paying you, um, that's really not true. It's kind of a fallacy, and I have no idea where this thought got its start, but a lot of people believe that music supervisors will try and pay you as little as they possibly can 
Um, some people actually believe that the supervisor is given a budget and anything that they spend underneath, under the budget. So let's say they're given, I don't know, $50,000 for an episode of a drama on a big TV show. Um, some people are of the belief that if the music soup brings in all the music for 42000 that the supervisor gets to pocket the remaining 8000 Not true. I've been told that by many, many supervisors over the years, as well as a few library owners. And so here's how it goes. I mean, there's several ways it can go, but this is kind of a typical thing, which is an episode, let's say it's a, I'm trying to think of a show, I don't know, whatever TV show, something that has a fair amount of music in it, uh, whether it's music in cars or bars or restaurants, you know, background source music. Um, and oftentimes there's a song that's played during a montage where it's pushed up nice and loud and it's featured, and there's no dialogue happening. And if that is from a, an act, a band, an artist that's pretty well known to extremely well known, that one song will actually get the lion's share of that 50K. So let's say that one song that licenses for 30,000 bucks. So now they've got 20,000 left for the other five pieces of music in the show that are less significant and less featured uh, and probably in the background and probably background source music in a bar, in a hotel lobby, in a car, whatever. So they'll take the balance of what's left after they finish negotiating for that really primo piece of music from a, a known artist. Um, and then they will divvy that up equally amongst the other things and they just set the price. And if you don't want to like, so in this case, uh, my math being decent, I think, um, the remaining 20K amongst five pieces would mean that each piece was going to generate a sync fee, an upfront fee of $4,000, which is in that two to $5,000 range. So when the music supervisor reaches out to the library or to you individually or personally and says, um, I'd like to use your piece of music and that slot pays $4,000. Um, I do know a few people over the years have told me they've negotiated a little bit and gotten a little bit more money, not a significant amount, but the vast majority of my friends in the industry tell me um, if a supervisor calls up, says, I've got uh, 4,000 bucks, I want to use your piece of music in this show, just say yes. Um, you could politely say, is there any wiggle room on that? I wouldn't go for a hard negotiation because they've already divvied up the money according to how many slots are left and what they've got left over after they pay for that big ticket song. So there you go. Little education with tonight's music biz quiz. All right, next question. I think we're up to number six now. Um, who ultimately decides which music is used in a feature film? Who ultimately decides which music is used in a feature film? And this is not multiple choice. It's a one word answer. Who ultimately decides? Alex Dillon wins this one. The director. Ooh, a lot of you guys knew the answer. Good job. Producer would decide on a TV show, Simon, um, and rarely would the producer, um, you know, have creative input. Um, if the director, well, I don't even want to get it. That's, that's a show within itself, but or of itself. But uh, the director, like 90, 95% of the time, the director is going to make that creative choice because it's the director's vision as to how the film should be made. The music supervisor's job is to present options um, and help get the music licensed and cleared. So while a lot of people think that the music supervisor is kind of like the A&R person, um, their job is to go find it, present options, the director chooses the option, then the music supervisor goes to work to reach out, license the piece of music for what they've got in the budget, 
uh, and then take care of clearing it, make, making sure that they can actually legally use it and all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted. So there you go on that one. All right, question number seven. Uh, what type of microphone is known for handling the highest levels emanating from the sound source without distorting? What type of microphone is known for handling the highest levels emanating from the sound source without distorting? Multiple choice. First answer is A, condenser microphone. B is a dynamic microphone. C is a ribbon microphone. And D is a crystal microphone. I'm going to give this one, uh, unless Liz tells me different, to Keith Sumner, got dynamic right off the bat. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to give Keith a point and whoever got um, the first letter B, because I think Keith probably answered before I gave out the A, Bs. So Keith gets a point, Liz, and Ken Messford gets a point. He was the first person with the letter B. I'm surprised nobody went for the crystal microphone. <laughs> Do you remember those? I was a Cub Scout, and I did that for a project once, built a, a, a crystal radio receiver, and then they also had a crystal microphone kit, which was basically wire wrapped around a little crystal or something. Didn't sound that good. Not a lot of bottom end on that mic. Okay, question number eight, I believe. Which country, and this is multiple choice, so hold off. Which country doesn't pay performance royalties for theatrical screenings? A, Liechtenstein, B, Moldova, C, the United States, and D, Russia. Which country doesn't pay performance royalties for theatrical screenings? A, Liechtenstein, B, Moldova, C, the United States, and D, Russia. Looks like Jim Stamper got that one. It is C, the United States. All right. Good job, Jim Stamper. Stamper, can't talk. What can I say, it's 10.30 at night. I shouldn't be working this late, but for you guys, almost anything. All right, you guys ready for the next one? I think this is number nine. Um, and this one is taxi specific. Okay, uh, let's see. How many years has taxi been in business? How many years has taxi been in business? Just a straight up answer, no multiple choice. I should have done multiple choice on that one. Oh, you're welcome, guys. <laughs> Nancy Kalel scores a big win with that one. 29 years. Nice going, Nance. Hot on the trigger. Wow, a lot of you guys got that answer right. I started it in 1992. I did, I did. Wow, good job, Nancy. Okay, next question. And this one's not multiple choice. Uh, you know what, I'm gonna make this one true or false. I'm gonna reword it and make it true false. Um, you should stop pitching a particular piece of music after it gets forwarded by taxi. You should stop pitching a particular piece of music after it gets forwarded by taxi, true or false. All right, whoa. 
For those of you who answered true, you are so wrong. No, keep pitching it. Pitch that shiz all day long until somebody offers you a deal that you like. Just because it's been forwarded somewhere, and by the way, Namdesimo uh, scores a big win on that one. He got the first F on my computer. Hopefully Liz is... Uh, Liz, let me know that you are in fact seeing things come in the same in the same order that I am. I want to make sure that we're being as fair as humanly possible on this little adventure tonight. That was a softball. I tried to throw in some softballs because I knew that a couple of these were hard. Thank you, Liz. I'm starting to get worried now. Does, I don't think anybody's got two right yet. What do I do if there's a tie amongst like 30 people or something? We may give, be giving away like ice cream or something. Um, okay, you ready for the next question? Um, okay, this one's multiple choice. What does it mean when a lyric is referred to as being universal? A, it appeals to a wide range of people. B, it's already signed to Universal Music. C, it doesn't use specific references to name, dates, time, places, brands, and profanity, so it's unlikely to conflict with the storyline or script in a TV show or film or TV, uh, film or TV commercial. And D, it could easily be synced in a broadcast of the Miss Universe pageant. Once again, what does it mean? Oh, people are already answering. Okay. Um, and let me see. The correct answer was C. And I'm scrolling back up, and it looks like Ken Mesford gets that one with the letter C. Just for a little edification on that one. A lot of people think when something is a universal lyric that it will appeal to a wide range of people. Not true. Um, I mean, you could make that statement, but it's not true in the context of pitching music for film and TV. Uh, oops, lost my place here. Hang on, going back. All right, it really means that it's universal, like it could work in a lot of different scenes, scenarios, and scripts. Um, I've used this example literally a thousand times, I think, now which is to say that if I wrote a song about Michael met Deborah under the arch in St. Louis on a snowy Christmas Eve, you can't use that lyric in anything but a movie that has two characters named Michael and Deborah that takes place on New Year's Eve while it's snowing under the arch in St. Louis. The odds of that happening are practically nil. Um, Sorry, I've got a squeaky stool. I will be really glad to get home and not have that stool anymore. Um, anyway, so there you go. That's the answer on that one. Hang on a second. I've got to check an inbound. Uh, Bria's watching the show. Thank you, Bria. Um, okay, now going back to my mail. So yeah, universal in the context of pitching music for film and TV, pitching songs specifically, means that the lyrics are very general. I met her and she made me feel wonderful. I met her and she changed my life. My world became wonderful when I met her. <laughs> Those are universal thoughts that could apply to a lot of stuff and wouldn't get in the way of a script that's about Michael and Deborah, I guess. I don't know. But you get what I'm saying, right? Okay. Moving on. I think we're up to number 10. Ooh, this one's a doozy. All right. This one's multiple choice. Brace yourselves. Um, hello, Tim Harrison. No points off for being late. Uh, did I... 
Hold on. Somebody's saying I got that before Ken. Uh, not on my thing. Um, sorry. Remember Nandismo at the beginning of the show? I said sometimes that you guys see in your chat shows up differently than what we get as moderators on our chat. So on my chat, I just went back to check it and I had Chaz Smith, Karen Brasher, Nathan Marshall, um, Todd B's Groove 45, RKR, John Solly, Simon Burnham, um, Jan W, and then Ken Mesford came in with the letter C, so he went, won the point. Sorry. Them is the rules. All right. Whoops. Scrolling back down. Um, okay. When a music library says that they've issued a blanket license, does it mean A, your music is going to be used in a new product, the Lullaby Baby Blanket, B, the music library's client is given a large catalog of music for a flat fee on an all-they-can-eat basis, C, the license will come in the mail, but it will be blank, or D, you need to go to the DMV to pick up your money generated by that license. Once again, when a music library says they've issued a blanket license, does it mean A, your music is going to be used in a new product called the Lullaby Baby Blanket, B, the music library's client is given a large catalog of music for a flat fee on an all-they-can-eat basis, C, the license will come in the mail, but it will be blank, or D, you need to go to the DMV to pick up your money generated by that license. Marion, I'm not even going to bother. <laughs> Come on, Marion. Uh, okay, and the answer was B. And let's see who got the first B. Was Ken Mesford. Dude, you're on fire. All right. And, and Liz, feel free to let me know if I say somebody, you know, was the first answer and you see it differently in yours, please do let me know. But I think we're seeing the same thing. Okay. I think the deal is that when you type it in on your computer, you show up before other people or something like that, because we've had this issue a few times over the years, but that's why we've got to judge by what we see on our end. Okay. Um, moving on to the next question. What are we up to now? Like question 11 or 12? Um, so much for doing a shorter show. All right, this one's multiple choice and it's a doozy. Um, you meet an industry professional at a networking event. What should you do first? A, tell them how versatile you are and how many genres of music you can make. B, Tell them how many years you've been making music. C, tell them how you were offered a major label deal about 10 years ago, but you turned them down because you hate major labels. Or D, ask them how they got started in the music industry and what their favorite part of their job is. You meet an industry professional at a networking event, what should you do first? A, tell them how versatile you are and how many genres of music you can make. B, tell them how many years you've been making music. C, tell them how you were offered a major label deal 10 years ago, but turned them down because you hate major labels. And D, ask them how they got started in the music industry and what the favorite part of their job is. The answer is D, but you would be shocked how many people will give them those other three answers. Um, and the first person on my chat, uh, to get a D is Lamar Franklin. Yay, Lamar. See that? When I was a kid, if I got a D, I got in trouble. In this case, Lamar gets a D. He's the winner. And this is why we love Taxi TV. Oh, good. A lot of people got that one right. I smell cake batter and I know I'm sitting in the kitchen actually of the apartment we're renting and nobody's making a cake but I smell cake. Super blonde in the house. All right, next question. 
This one to multiple choice as well. Uh, signing an exclusive publishing agreement means that A, your music is in a high class catalog with only top notch music in it. B, only that company can represent that piece of music. C, you're the only client they represent. Or D, that you can do a mix minus vocal and sign the same track with another company. Signing an exclusive publishing agreement means that A, your music is in a high class catalog with only top notch music in it. B, only that company can represent that piece of music. C, you're the only client that company represents. Or D, you can do a mix minus vocal and sign the same track with another company. And the answer is B. Look at that. I think we got everybody got a B on that one. All right. And on my chat, it looks like Tim Harrison got it with the first letter B. Congratulations, Tim. Awesome. Everybody got the right answer on that one. Yay. Okay. You guys better get this one right because I talk about it a lot. Uh, this one's true or false. If you've signed a publishing administration deal with an online music distributor who promised to try and help you monetize your music, it's okay to go ahead and sign a deal for the same music with an exclusive library. True or false? If you've signed a publishing admin deal with an online music distributor who promised to try and help you monetize your music, it's okay to go ahead and sign a deal for the same music with an exclusive library. True or false? Clearly that is false. And everybody got it. I got to say, Ken Mesford, you are on fire. You and Nam Dismo, um, but Ken got it again. Nam Dismo, you're right behind him. Nathan Marshall, Keith Sumner, Lamar Franklin. I mean, all you guys got that one right. I'm so happy that nobody answered true to that one. So happy. <laughs> uh, okay. This one is also true or false. When pitching your songs to artists on a major record label, it's okay if your vocals are pitchy because they'll be more interested in the song and not the vocal performance. True or false? When pitching your songs to artists on a major record label, it's okay if your vocals are pitchy because they'll be more interested in the song and not the vocal performance. True or false? And the answer to that one is false. Um, and Tim Harrison got another one. Go, Tim, go. Um, okay, so there are always exceptions to everything. I can't say that 100% of the time um, that the vocal doesn't have great import in, in demo presentation, but like 99% of the time, the song... The song has to be great. That's just a given. A great vocal might make a song that's a B plus into an A minus. But take an A plus song and put a bad vocal on it, even just a mediocre or kind of weakish vocal on it, and that's going to take it out of contention. The reason is if the vocal delivery on the demo is super strong, it just makes it that much more obvious and desirable to the person that it's being pitched to, namely, ultimately, the artist. So, yeah, you know, we'd all like to believe that can't they just hear through the vocal? Can't they just hear the song and know that it's great? And I wish that were true. Um, maybe for a very few people it is, but more often than not, the rule of thumb in the industry is the vocals just got to kick butt because the vocal is what sells it. Uh, it's kind of like great landscaping on a house uh, or great, what do they call it? Curb appeal, great curb appeal on a house. Um, the interior of the house could be like architectural digest, just beautiful, flawless, tastefully done. But if the outside of the house is meh, then they may never walk into the house. So 
That's the best comparison or analogy I can come up with today, so just roll with it. Um, okay, moving on, scrolling down. Marion Laird says, good analogy. Thanks, Marion. I have a fan club of one. I did say that a few weeks ago. Okay. All right. Next question. And this one is also true or false. When pitching to taxi, you should try and figure out which industry listings will get the least number of submissions and pitch to those because there will be less competition. True or false. When pitching your music to taxi, you should try and figure out which industry listings will get the least number of submissions and pitch to those because there will be less competition. True or false? <laughs> Namdissimo, you got this one. Yay, good going. It was false. Uh, it's a really common misconception. That's why I put this question in there. This is the educational part of tonight's show. Is I want people to know that it doesn't matter if we get 800 submissions or if we get 80 submissions. Uh, you're never competing against your fellow members. Whatever is good, I mean, great above the you know above the quality bar for being really really good and on target for what they asked for. That's what gets forwarded. It's not like we listen to them and then go, oh, let me go back and listen to number 23 again, because I think that number 34 was better than number 23. We don't play that game. There is no competition at Taxi. If we get 100 submissions and 27 of them are above the quality bar and on target stylistically, 27 will get forwarded. So there you go. All right, here's another true false. If I owned the apartment that I'm sitting in right now, I would take this stool and toss it over the balcony. Um, it is one squeaky stool. Okay, uh, true or false, when creating an instrumental cue, you should include an intro that's at least 35 seconds long to give the video editors a nice long on-ramp to get in the groove of your piece. When creating an instrumental cue, you should include an intro that's at least 35 seconds long to give the video editors a nice long on-ramp to get in the groove of your piece. True or false? Uh, wow, a lot of people are getting this one wrong. Tim Harrison is the first false that I've got. Um, so Tim, you win the point on that one. No, you don't want a nice long intro. The video editors move very, very quickly when they're choosing music, especially for um, uh, reality TV shows. So they want to get right to the red meat as quickly as possible so that they know, oh, I get what this music is about. It sounds like something I could use or it's not. So if you've got like a long intro and it's taking its time, they're just gonna skip. They're literally gonna hit the skip button and go right to the next piece because they, do we have, still have skip buttons? You know what I'm saying. <laughs> Uh, get to the red meat. Uh, I will share with you something that I've shared before on Taxi TV, but I'm going to say it again. A couple of years ago at the Taxi Road Rally, we had an incredibly talented video editor who does tons of big reality TV shows. And she said, honestly, what I really like is a, an instrumental cue that starts out with just like a drum turnaround, boom, 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 right into the music, or even just a, a beat. You know, it could just be like a kick, hi-hat, snare, boom, right into it. Something up front to cut on and then right into the red meat, which would be kind of equivalent of a chorus. Um, they don't want 
an intro. And if you do have an intro, uh, it's got to be very much in line with what the mood and the sonic texture and the melody of the whole piece is and keep it really short. I mean, really short. They don't care about intros. That is one of the biggest fallacies out there. So um, I'm glad that a bunch of you got that wrong. So it gave me the opportunity to get you on the right path because we want you to be successful. All right, uh, this one is along the same lines. Um, this one's also multiple choice. Oh, not true or false. This one is multiple choice. This one's also about video editors. And the question is, video editors prefer instrumental cues with non-faded endings because A, it's an old habit that refuses to die. B, it's hard to edit audio on a faded ending and a stinger or buttoned ending is more definitive. C, editors are lazy and just want to get the edit over with. D, non-faded endings are mandated under federal law. Video editors prefer instrumental cues with non-faded endings because A, it's an old habit that refuses to die. B, it's hard to edit audio on a faded ending. Uh, and a stinger or button ending is more definitive. C, editors are lazy and just want to get the edit over with. Or D, non-faded endings are mandated under federal law. Let's see what you guys answered. Oh, a lot of people answered that. And B was the correct answer. And Karen Brasher was the first one to get it. Congratulations, Karen Brasher. You've won the brand new Mercedes. I am kidding. You don't even win like a model of a Mercedes on this show. It's pretty low budget. Okay, um, good one. <laughs> Who said that? Randall House says um, the answer was B, but C, editors are lazy, just want to get the edit over with in some cases. Yeah, you may, might be right about that, Randall. Um, okay. Marion loves the funny choices. I'm glad somebody out there thinks they're funny. I read a couple of them to my wife and one of my daughters, and they're like, Really? This is what you do for a living? <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, next one is multiple choice. And the question is, taxi members often report this type of music gets licensed from them most often. A, sexy music. B, bombastic music. C, simple and sparse music. And D, compositionally brilliant music. Taxi members often report that this type of music gets licensed from them most often. A, sexy music, B, bombastic music, C, simple and sparse music, or D, compositionally brilliant. Whoa, the answers are flying in. Oh, man, I hate that when my phone goes back to the top of the list. Where did the answer go? Here we go. The answer was C, simple and sparse. Let me go back up to the top and see who got this one. Karen Brasher gets another one. The crowd goes wild. Nice going, Karen Brasher. <laughs> Dan Weber's too sexy for his music. Uh, I don't know about that, Dan. <laughs> All right, we are cruising right along here. All right, next one is multiple choice again. When signing with a music library, more often than not, A, the contract can be negotiated. B, the company is hoping you're not too smart and they can take advantage of you. C, the contract will be about 25 pages long, but only the first and last pages are important. D, the contracts are standard and rarely negotiated. 
When signing with a music library, more often than not, A, the contract can be negotiated, B, the company is hoping you're not too smart and they can take advantage of you, C, the contract will be about 25 pages long, but only the first and last pages are important, and D, the contracts are standard and rarely negotiated. Ooh, looks like a lot of people might have gotten this one right. Uh, looks like Jim Stamper got it. Jim Stamper got it. The answer is D. The contracts are standard and rarely negotiated. Um, a record deal, you can negotiate the contract. Music library, um, they oftentimes have hundreds if not thousands of composers in their catalog. And if they had a different contract for each of them, um, even just different terms, if the, if the verbiage in the contract was exactly identical, but you get 50%, you get 55%, you get 42%. When it came time to do their quarterly accounting, their heads would explode. So the bottom line is the contracts are pretty standard. There are rare exceptions. If somebody has been in a music library for five or 10 years, and they are just an absolute all-star in that library, maybe, and I have heard of a few rare instances with friends of mine in the industry that they were able to negotiate um, a better deal because number one, they make a lot of money for the company. Uh, and number two, they turn in a ton of music for the company. So they're almost like their own catalog within the greater catalog. So libraries have been known to make exceptions for that, but the vast, vast, vast majority of the contracts are, this is what we offer. I'm sorry if you don't like it, but we can't change it. So thanks for calling. Bye-bye. Oh, that was the last question. Well, there you go. And it's 1057. I set a goal to try and end the show at 11 o'clock tonight. So Liz, can you um, tabulate the, the score and send it to me on WhatsApp? Uh, don't publish it publicly yet, because I want to see if, if the person who won is somebody that I like. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I just want to know. I'm going to have, like, night terrors tonight if we get, like, four people, that, you know, with a tie score, although Bria did come up with a good solution for that, which is if we have more than two, if we have two people that tie, I'm going to flip a coin to see... Um, who gets the, the membership and who gets the, the hoodie. And if we have like three, four, five people that tie, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put all those names into a hat and draw one winner. All right, the answer is here from Liz. Ken Mesford wins with five, yay! Nice going, Ken. Um, Congratulations. Okay, so if you would get in touch with Liz at taxi.com um, and have her make a note in our database that you won a free renewal, when your next renewal comes up, just reach out to us and say, please check your database. You'll see a note in there that I want a free renewal on a fantastic episode of Taxi TV Live. Um, so was that fun? Was it educational? I hope so. Um, I had a good time writing the questions, I gotta say. Slow-mo instant replay. Welcome. <laughs> anyway, all right, you guys, I'm gonna sign off and I'm gonna go cuddle up on the couch with my wife and my daughter and enjoy family movie night because unless my, <laughs> unless my latest COVID test comes back positive, I will be flying home on Wednesday. So I've got very little time to spend here with the family. Um, I will see you guys next Monday. Oh, by the way, I keep forgetting to say this while I've been doing these shows overseas. Give us a thumbs up. Please give us a like. Um, YouTube likes us when you like us. Um, they treat us better. If you're not already a subscriber to the channel, please smash that red button and subscribe. 
Um, also, next Monday, one week from tonight, there will not be a Taxi TV because number one, I will be comatose with jet lag, but more importantly, it's going to be Memorial Day weekend, so Taxi will be closed. Um, pretty much the entire United States is on holiday on Monday. I forget the, what the date is, the 31st, I think, something like that. So that's it. Um, have a great rest of your day, you guys. Fun hanging out with you. <clears throat> there is a little possibility. I'm not making, <clears throat> excuse me, hang on. May 31st, confirmed for May 31st. Thank you for the good wishes on a safe trip home. Um, it's a little chance. I, I hope I have the brain power to do it, but maybe on Thursday or Friday, maybe I'll do a quickie um, taxi quarantini happy hour. I've missed doing those a lot, but it's just such a pain in the butt. If you guys could see my rig, as a matter of fact, when the show goes off air, I'm gonna take a picture of my rig that I've been using over here. Um, oh, I'm not worried about being sick, Mary, uh, but thank you. Um, they just make you get tested. I've been tested for COVID more times, I think, than the president has at this point. Um, and you have to have, you know, all these little cards and you have to have your health insurance. We had to get overseas health insurance. We have to get a card from the health insurance people saying that we're COVID free before they let you on the plane, all that stuff. So um, anyway, if I had any semblance of a brain on Thursday or Friday of this week, I may surprise you guys with a quarantine. We'll send out an email. Um, and if not, I will see you when I see you. Um, let me just get home, regain consciousness from the flight, um, get past Memorial Day weekend. I hope you guys all have a great Memorial Day holiday if you're in the U.S. And uh, yeah, think about the soldiers that gave their lives so that uh, we can live as a free nation. That's something worth remembering. Thank you all. Have a great night. Uh, oh, I do have theme music. It's just no applause and it's really short. Um, <laughs> I feel like such a doofus, but, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> Where's my theme music? Oh, my goodness. How can I do this without theme music? I've got to have theme music. Come on, come on. I've got all kinds of pictures. There we go. Stuff over here, but... Good night, you guys.